Welcome to Gallery 7. We have a very special display of art. These are photographs taken by astronauts on the International Space Station. I'm Dan Barstow. I'm the curator of this show. I work with the astronauts on some photography that they do from space, develop some software they're using that I'll tell you a little bit more about later, but also able to see the photographs that they download every day. They're amazing pictures. They show the Earth in its full glory. They show the sky, the thin horizon, and so on. I'd like to give you a little guided tour of some of them. We'll intersperse some close-ups and then let you see the broader picture. And I'll tell you a little bit about this grand adventure of exploring Earth from space. The first images that we have here are an interesting array of day and night pictures. This first one at the top here shows a sunrise. Now, what I really like about this is just this thin horizon you see, the brightness and the reds and the oranges, you see this incredible gradation. The astronauts circle the Earth every 92 minutes. So it takes 46 minutes daytime, 46 minutes night, as they go through the transition 16 times a day. Imagine seeing so many sunrises and sunsets. It takes sort of like a zen peacefulness to be able to take a photograph like that with the sudden glaring of the sun as it rises or sets. The next picture shows the moon. Now in this picture there's a very thin color of blue on the horizon, the moon above. Again this setting and rising happens very quickly. But the astronauts, I'm sure, are remembering the days of Apollo and seeing the moon, that the voyage that the astronauts, the Apollo astronauts did. The International Space Station actually orbits relatively low. It's what's called a low Earth orbit, about 250 miles above the surface of the Earth. They're still above the vast bulk of the atmosphere. They're in a zero gravity environment because as the orbit, it's the physics of it, they're like constantly falling and that makes it feel like zero gravity. But they are relatively close to the Earth. I'd now like to show you a couple of nighttime pictures. This first one is over the Mediterranean. If you look closely, you can see the boot of Italy. Its heel is pointing down there's the shape of the toe of the boot. There's the island of Sicily. The nighttime pictures are actually quite dramatic. They show the city lights with a fair amount of detail. You don't get house-by-house house lights, but you do get streets and regions. It tells the story of the culture, of where people have settled, mostly along the coast in Italy or along rivers, but not in the mountains. You see little tiny places of where there's national parks, where there are not a lot of lights. So the lights really tell a very interesting story. The next picture here is a picture of Istanbul. Now, if you look closely, you can see quite a variety of lights and shapes. Istanbul has a, over a 2,000 year history of settling, different cultures have come in, the way they've laid out the streets and towns and roadways varied over this time. Now they have super highways. But across the image, there are some parts where there's a grid-like pattern, which is a very modern sort of street design. And there are parts where the streets just curve around, which was, say, a couple thousand years ago when they were ox carts uh, roads. This panoply of nighttime pictures and the sunrises and sunsets gives you a sense of, let's say, the nighttime perspective. We'll now shift to the daytime perspective and show you a few more. We now see another interesting collection. This one at the bottom here, this shows a hurricane. Now the astronauts see a lot of weather happening. Often they're taking pictures where there are no clouds so they can see the land. But often they do explicitly want to take pictures of the weather it says it's happening. Partly this is for scientific research and for uh, helping people understand and prepare for these events, to helping the meteorologists better forecast the strength and understand the path of the hurricane. The spiraling happens as the air is 
spinning around. It happens converging of different storms, different um, air masses that are interweaving, forming this huge, sometimes 500 kilometers or bigger. You may remember Sandy was a huge hurricane covering almost the entire eastern seaboard. This one is at dusk, and there's a little bit of light on the side from the sun coming in from the side, but it does give a lot of the texture of this weather event. Moving up, this is one that I call our neck of the woods. Here, the astronauts used a wide angle lens to get a broad perspective. This is New England. There's Cape Cod, Long Island, on up into Montreal and Quebec, the Great Lakes, and then the horizon beyond. Looking at this, you might try to guess when, what part of the year, what season was this? I'll give you a moment to think about that. But you should just look at any kind of signals that might tell you what that might be. Well, this is actually winter. If you look closely, you won't see it over southern New England, but on into Canada, there's ice and snow. This was actually taken in late March. Over here, the Great Lakes, one of the Great Lakes has some ice on it, one does not. That's one of the mysteries of trying to understand the image. But it's still also with the curvature, you get to see our area, what we call our neck of the woods. Over here, we shift to a close-up view. This is the very tip of Cape Cod, Provincetown. Now, this was taken with a 800 millimeter lens. They looked very closely. Now, of course, they're moving at 17,000 miles an hour. So they have to either pan with the camera or take a very fast picture in order to avoid blur. But this one shows the level of detail they can get. There's race point and then the curvature of the, that's caused by the water and the ocean circulating around and the sand spit as it comes around. If you look closely at the original, you can even see the wharfs and the streets of, of uh, P-Town, as we call it here. There also is a little bit of the silt, a light green that is along the coast that colors the water as sand blends in with the ocean. Below it, we see another island. This is Crooked Island in the Bahamas. I'll say that I've seen tens of thousands of photographs that the astronauts have taken. They love to photograph the Bahamas. This blue color is something that somehow appears, appeals to the soul. It is such a marvelous blending of the, the aquas, the light green, the deeper blue around this island. This happens because the sand and the um, coral underneath and around the island is relatively shallow. The water is very clear, so that the sun reflecting off gives this incredibly beautiful variation. There's a relatively unpopulated island, maybe 300 or so people enjoy this beauty here. You also can see the clouds forming. These are called cloud streets. They're like sort of in lines like a road or a street. The interaction of the atmosphere, the ocean, the land cause with the wind blowing from the right to the left cause these uh, clouds to form. At this point, we'll take a break, and I'd like to tell you a little bit more about the background of what it's like on the International Space Station when the astronauts take these pictures. Now I'd like to tell you a little bit more about the experience of being on orbit, being an astronaut. I wish I could tell you from personal experience. I'm not an astronaut, but I work with many who are and have followed the space program, of course, since childhood, like many of us have. This is a wonderful view of the Mediterranean. Here is that boot of Italy. But importantly, right here, this is the International Space Station. From this picture, you get a sense of the scale and the height and the view as they look out orbiting the Earth. The space station has been around for about 15 years. 
It's an international program with the U.S. and Russia and Europe and Japan as the leads, but there have been, I believe, some on the order of 75 astronauts who have been on the space station by now. They typically are up there for a six-month period of time doing science research and, of course, enjoying the view of Earth. You might ask, how did we get this picture? Well, this was taken from the internet, from the space shuttle. If you look closely up here, there's just a little bit of a tail and then a little bit of an arm over here. As the space shuttle went back from the ISS, it was able to get this dramatic perspective. They had just brought some astronauts up. We're bringing some other astronauts back. Here's a more of a close-up of the space station. It's about the size of a football field. That includes the solar panels. That's the largest part. These brown uh, and gold solar panels provide all the electrical power for the space station. They're constantly pointing at the sun and moving around. It does also get energy for boosting its orbit from the rockets that are connected up, the spaceships that are connected. But it is a quite a large facility. In fact, you can often see it at dawn or dusk when it's still in the sunlight. Based on if you look up uh, on the web, there are a number of sources that can tell you exactly when to see it. It's quite dramatic to see it flying over. Now, the astronauts love the zero gravity. Here's an astronaut as she floats through, just enjoying that motion. Now, astronauts have to be careful not to get sick in space. The, but within days or weeks, they get used to the environment. And are able to just push themselves off and go from one location to another. But of most relevance to our work here is the cupola. This was installed a few years ago. It has six win windows on the side, one in the center, and the astronauts just love to go there to observe, photograph Earth, and just find some serenity. They do have scientific assignments. Every day they're supposed to photograph some six targets that scientists select, an erupting volcano, a flooded region, or something else like that. But in fact, as part of the purpose of this is recognizing the psychological power. Now, in fact, the cupola is upside down, looking at Earth this way. It's like a bucket that they scoot down into but they're constantly reorienting themselves as to which way is up and down. Once they're in the cupola, this is the kind of view they get. The photographs are handheld camera photography. That is, they point the camera and say, oh cool, look at that, click, and that, click. So it's not like a satellite or a fixed mounted camera, it involves the human mind, which to me is the most compelling power of these photographs. It's not just a random picture. It is the mind and the heart and the soul saying, oh, what a wonderful planet we live on. This picture captures an essence of it. Now, you may wonder how they know where they are and what they're photographing. In fact, as they go around at 7 miles per second or 17,000 miles an hour, they have about 30 seconds from when a target comes into view and when it's passed by the window. Well, this is an area where I'm pleased to say that I've been involved in helping the astronauts with that issue. We've developed some software called Windows on Earth that operates in the space station it simulates the view out the real window, constantly changing as the real view changes, with targets marked. Now, this software is now on the space station. Here's Karen Nyberg, the first astronaut who installed and used it, to help her understand what she's seeing. Here's a bit of a close-up of what that software provides. This is that same central window that they have. This is over Peru. Here's a target marked called Lima, Peru. It says use a 250 millimeter lens. Here's the orbital path. And this is what we call the 10 minute look ahead as it takes, in this case, about seven minutes to go across South America. 
but really, I don't want to burden you with thinking more and more about the technical details of life on the space station. What I'd like to do is show you a few more of these marvelous photographs that the astronauts have taken. We now take you back to see some more of the photographs. Earlier, you saw some pictures that emphasized a literal view of a hurricane or an island or a nighttime view of Italy. We now see a few pictures that are a bit more abstract. Earth is actually a palette as if painted by an artist. And the photographs capture a small element, a large element, something that in some ways is not even a literal interpretation of what we see, but an abstraction. This photograph took a long time to figure out where this was. We're able to reconstruct the view, but I was looking around at the maps and the Google Earth and so on to try to figure out where this was, and eventually realized that this is the Great Salt Lake in Utah. Now, we see these beautiful greens, the purple over here, this gray, and then some different patterns down here. Very interesting array of shapes and colors. The Great Salt Lake, interestingly, with all the salt, there actually is a division in two parts of it. One of it is relatively green. Another is actually purple, this little corner over here, coming from the algae that grow in the lake and the different sort of species that are there. Here's a mountain outcrop. And down here is a salination facility where they leave the water out and the, the water evaporates and they're able to get the salt for, and other chemicals for commercial purposes. Recently, the firm that's been here has decided to withdraw from that work and just let it return to a natural state as part of planetary stewardship. This next picture almost defies description. It looks like a dancing figure up here, like um, the, the browns and the greens are just sort of interweaving. This is actually Dervish Bay in um, Asia. It almost looks like the whirling dervishes of, of lore. The water here, the sand, all combine in this wonderful abstraction. Here's the Nile River. This green is incredibly fertile. And then there's this winding, thin Nile River as it floods, flowing this way into the Mediterranean. You can just imagine the early history in that part of the world as the first cultures and society formed. That's an effect of the geography. The people needed to move from the desert into the area along the river, learn to crop, to grow plants, and to work together in that very tightly confined space. It's partly how we developed ourselves as a societal species that the environment shapes where and how we grow and learn. We now shift from the early history of humankind in Egypt to a modern city. This is Manhattan. Some two million people live in the greater Manhattan area. We can see the entire tip of the island from Wall Street way up to the other end of Queens and beyond. In the center, you see Central Park. Individual buildings appear. You can see ships as they move around. Now, we can certainly examine in detail as a map to understand how Manhattan is structured. But I think it's perhaps more useful to use this as a vehicle for seeing where and how different parts of the city built up. For example, the tallest buildings are in this central area, just south of Central Park, and in the very tip around Wall Street. Well, it turns out that underneath Manhattan, 
that's where there's the strong, strongest substrate of rocks. So when they built the buildings, they could build them taller in those areas. Other parts, like around Central Park, have a softer substrate, so the buildings aren't quite as tall, and it's an optimal place for, in this case, a park and some of the shorter buildings. One could spend much time examining this, and I hope you do download it and take a closer look. Let's shift now out to this fascinating picture. Any of you who have flown over central and western U.S. may recognize some of these circular shapes. This is pivot irrigation. They drill a pipe down in the center of each of these circles. They pump the water up. And then they have an arm that pivots around, spreading the water in that circle in order to fertilize and water the crops that grow there. It opened up, this technology opened up the ability to greatly expand this area and its use for crops and growing. Another interesting part of this, though, is how this part in the upper right is brown and the lower left is white. Why do you think that is? Now, I'm going to let you ponder that for a moment and explain that we should consider these images not just beautiful and fascinating and informative, but consider them as mystery stories. When a scientist, or when you or I, as ordinary people, look at these images, we shouldn't just rely on somebody else's explanation. We should use our own experience and intelligence and other resources to try to figure out what might be going on. I did that in looking closely at this image. Then I looked up when it was taken in late March, and I thought, this is interesting. This white apparently is a snowstorm. This is just the edge. The storm was over here. This white is what's left of that snow. Not enough snow fell in this area, so that's still brown. We're tracking right at the exact edge of that storm. When you get a chance to look closely at this image, you'll also see a little town in here, which gives you a sense of the scale. Interestingly, this town is called Center. Colorado, in the center of the image. We'll continue our journey around the world to this image. Now, remember, the astronauts go around the world in 92 minutes. During those 92 minutes, the Earth rotates, so their circle goes over a different location. They also are constantly going from the northern part up to 51 degrees northern latitude to 51 southern latitude at this angle that they're just going around and around. By the way, they can't steer the space station. It just goes round and around in this circle as the Earth rotates below. So now in continuing this journey around the world, we arrive at Brazil. This is where the Amazon River flows into the Atlantic the eastern coast. This dark part here, this green, is the jungle at the edge of uh, South America. The uh, uh, Amazon River now carrying over its entire realm. It's just picking up dirt and carrying it along. This brown flows out into the ocean the flowing ocean currents then blend the brown of the silt with, and, and dirt with the blue of the ocean, making this wonderful gradation from brown to dark green, light green, and on into blue. Fortunately, this area is environmentally protected, enabling it to stay pristine for the future. We conclude now with three final images. This one I sometimes call the splat. It's such a strange shape. These wildly curving shapes, these strange colors, it almost looks surreal. In fact, 
This is a riverbed. It's a flat floodplain. The river winds its way over thousands and tens of thousands of years, forming these side pathways, and then the erosion changes, and they connect, and that breaks off what's called an oxbow lake. You'll see several of them in here. There's so much water, they become very fertile, so there's a lot of green in there. But this constant weaving around just reveals the incredible power of Earth to change and shape itself as water flows as the dominant erosion force on our planet. At the other end of the extreme, in terms of the water, are the, is the frozen water, the glaciers. This picture shows the Patagonia region of Argentina and Chile, where glaciers are there year-round. Glaciers are essentially ice that flows down a valley. Glaciers are an essential part of Earth's ecosystem. Unfortunately, with climate change, as the Earth warms, the glaciers are one of the most important metrics of the warming planet. Astronaut photography over 50 years shows this incredible range as the glaciers have retreated. You can measure year after year, decade after decade, even from one day to the next as a piece breaks off. So from a scientific perspective, these photographs, the, the astronauts are assigned to photograph particular glaciers in order to monitor this change. You also can see in this picture some lakes where the water flows as it melts from the glacier. The glaciers and these lakes provide the water for the region and are an essential part of providing all over the world the water that we need. So our disruption of our climate and how it impacts on the glaciers raises some very important concerns. And I hope that one of the results of seeing these pictures is that you develop more of an appreciation, if not reverence, for our home planet Earth and help us all take better care of it. The final picture here is of the Aral Sea. In this case, the use of that water for other purposes, diverting it, has made this sea become smaller and smaller and almost disappear. It's quite tragic for that region, although this picture is quite beautiful. The shape that remains, the blue, the green, the browns, the curving, the lines as the water receded year after year. The beauty reminds us of what our planet can be, but what you see there reminds us of what we've been doing to our home planet. Well, thank you so much for taking the time and viewing these photographs. In fact, if you're unable to come to the show here at Gallery 7 in Maynard, Massachusetts, the show here ends September 27th. We'll find other places, I'm sure, for this traveling exhibit. But you can also see online every one of these photographs. You can download them. You can just enjoy their beauty. In order to do that, go to the website called windowsonearth.org. That's windowsonearth.org. This is through an educational nonprofit where we post the images taken by the astronauts, updated weekly, if not daily, with some selections of the most favorite ones, organized by different regions of the world, and it includes a special link to all of the images in this gallery with some descriptions of them. Thank you very much for joining us here, and we hope that you get to go in space sometime and experience this for yourself.